Hi, welcome to Conversations with the Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Buino, and today's guest is Michael Lassoff. He is a practicing psychotherapist in Houston, Texas, and he manages the Young Adult Intensive Outpatient Program for Pathos at the Lovett Center. He's also training to become a Diamond Approach Teacher, which is a spiritual group that incorporates meditative practices as well as psychoanalytic theory. So I got to tell you a funny story about Michael. Well, I guess it's not a very particular story, but I met Michael in, it was in January in Houston the first time we met and it was snowing in Houston and people who are from Chicago are like, okay, yeah, whatever, it's snowing. I mean, snowing in Houston is a big deal for them and literally the entire town shut down. Like I was supposed to be in Houston to, you know, meet everybody at the Lovett Center and go all about town and literally could not do any of that because the entire town shut down. So that was the first time I met Michael. The second time I met Michael, we tow up some karaoke in Houston. We were doing a leadership retreat for the team at Pathos. And in Houston, it was Gay Pride that weekend. And I don't remember which one of us had the brilliant idea to do karaoke, but we did. And I got to tell you, this man can do some karaoke like few others. So uh, I hope you enjoy this interview with Michael Lassoff. Well, how did you become a therapist? So from being a Sikh as a child and then having your parents kind of split off in different directions, religiously, spiritually, philosophically, how did you end up where you are now? Well, I was raised in a Sikh community. My name on my birth certificate was Guru Kirtan Singh Khalsa. And then my parents left that when I was around eight. And then uh, they divorced, and my dad went on to be a non-practicing Jew, and my mom kind of went to be a pretty devoted uh, Baptist. And I think between being raised Sikh and then both of them going their separate ways, you know, I think I just have a lot of question marks in terms of explanations for what's going on. And the main thing I'll say about the Sikhs is it was communal living, and I think I've always been drawn towards groups that are into growth and development. Like in middle school, I got really involved with 12-step communities, even though I'd never really done any drugs or drinking, really. Really? Drank. Yeah. That's and awesome. I, I went through the 12 <laughs> steps a couple times. And I, I think I just liked going there because, you know, middle school sucks and people were a bit nicer there. Mm. And, you know, it was just nice to be somewhere where when you said bye, people hugged you and said, I love you. I think... You know, the other side of that was growing up as a Sikh and wearing a turban and stuff. I think it was always a question for me whether I felt like I belonged or was kind of excluded or on the margins. And mm -hmm. even at the 12 step thing, you know, I mean, there was an interesting piece about feeling like whether I belong because I'd never really done any stuff. But, you know, and then I think through most of high school, I was kind of really involved with social climbing and that kind of thing. And I, I mm. started, became captain of lacrosse team at my high school and started listening to Dave Matthews band and boo and wearing blue jeans <laughs> and one of those white hats that said what college I was going to go to and I, wow. I, I dipped tobacco oh I my that. I, I got into baseball <laughs> that sounds uh, the tobacco part sounds very Texas it was I, so I was trying to fit in you know I think I don't know. You know, I, I was miserable. I was always kind of like depressed for most of high school. I spent most of mm. high school pretty depressed, usually in the wake of like some terrible romantic deterioration of some sort. <laughs> I, I just love how dramatic that phrase is, romantic deterioration. I love it. You know, honestly, that probably makes it sound like it came together <laughs> more than it did. I spent most of high school really in love with these gals that I barely knew. Mm. Um, I just had a very strong fantasy life um, mm. and imagined somebody loving me. And I was very lonely. A lot of, a lot of crying in my room by myself listening to Joni Mitchell. Oh, me too. Not Joni Mitchell, but yes. Yeah. No, no. You know, I mean, Elliot mm -hmm. Smith, you know, all the, all the classics. And then I got really into Buddhism. And I was, I was planning on ordaining as a Buddhist monk for most of college. and I could totally see that. Yeah, it was kind of the first thing I ever heard that made sense to me. And I think it was a really big deal to just have a narrative for the first time that mm -hmm. made sense of what I was feeling and didn't just sound like a nonsense. 
I'd never heard anything. I, I, you know, I wasn't really raised particularly theistically, and, and I think there were so many like competing truth claims that it was more confusing than anything, and I was mm. just in a lot of pain. So right. I think it meant a lot to me to be able to finally make a little meaning of that. And in some sense, it was a real, it was kind of the first time I felt a holding environment that comes from just understanding. Mm. Where like all of a sudden it seems like not just chaotic, but a kind of perspective that organizes things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but that was complicated wanting to be a monk. I think a lot of that was my way of trying to say fuck you to my dad. (laughs) Um, And and, uh, another big part of that was probably uh, how depressed I was about my sense that women didn't like me. Hmm. I just thought that like love was a shit show and relate like kind of human relatedness was just a dead end that terminates in kind of this empty, meaningless hell realm. (laughs) (laughs) Again, like the just way you talk, it's just amazing. Go on. I fucking love you. It probably sounds hyperbolic, but I mean, I was crying in my room a lot and none of it made any sense. I get it. It did feel that way for me too, actually well into my twenties. So yes. Uh, I totally wanted to die. I mean, it just, Mm -hmm. this this thing seems bullshit. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, (laughs) then I started seeing a therapist and, you know, for me, I'd always wanted to see a therapist. I think I don't know where I got that karma from but it just seemed like I'd always wanted to go because I thought that would help me make sense of all the crazy stuff I was thinking Mm -hmm. you know I mean for me it was it felt like almost like this really exciting Sherlock Holmes kind of like ooh, that's that's why I do that Mm. so my therapist was also a practicing Buddhist and it was really with him that I got to sort of see how much am I longing to be a monk was sort of a reaction formation to a lot yeah. of stuff that I think I was trying to skip dealing with. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, uh, what's the guy, the p- British poet, is it William Blake? Yeah, he's got that poem about the chimney sweep. And, you know, one of the things that I always stuck out with me is like the kid's hair is dirty, so they just cut it off, you know? Mm. And I think that that was kind of what I was, you know, rather than trying to work through something, I think I was just trying to cut off all my hair. Yeah, literally and figuratively. So, and anyways, then I got really involved with this group called the Diamond Approach, which has been my, you know, spiritual path for the past 15 years. I'm doing the teacher training program for that. And that one really integrates sort of the spiritual preoccupations I was dealing with, with a really pretty sophisticated psychological mindedness. It's grounded in object relations theory. Hmm. That was where I first started reading like Winnicott and Kohut and Kernberg and Fairbairn and Margaret Mahler and Melanie Klein. And and I guess that's probably around, you know, a bit into that was when I started thinking maybe I could make a living as a psychotherapist because I was just reading that stuff for fun. Mm, mm-hmm. And I guess I could also say that motivation wise, you know, when I was reading the information he sent me about exploring my feelings about healing, (laughs) I would say that by and large, that's pretty low on the totem pole of what drew me to Mm. being a therapist. I actually don't feel that strong of a longing to help people. (laughs) Go on. (laughs) I love that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Come to the Levitt Center. We're helping professionals. Sorry, Robert. We don't <laughs> give listening. a fuck if we help you. <laughs> oh, but... oh man, I can, I can, I can fix this. <laughs> How do I'm we not spin this? To helping people. Oh. Just <laughs> that. But the thing doesn't work unless it's helpful. I mean, I get right, that. Right, right. Um, Oh, so I can say this: my first job as a social worker was actually planning funerals for homeless people. Really? Yeah. So I worked for Harris County Community Service Department's Office of Social Services Indigent Bereavement Program. That's a mouthful. Right. I got, I, I, you had to get good at saying that. Yeah. So I worked there and it was, you know, actually Texas is in this one way quite liberal. You know, our, our program for, you know, in just the Texas charter is that if somebody dies in Texas, the state pays for their funeral services in a funeral. 
So if you die in Texas and you got nothing, the state will pay for a 15-minute funeral and cremation or burial. Huh. It's a cremation first policy, but you don't even have to go to have a good reason. You know, you just sort of, I think you would have wanted to be buried and that's kind of good enough. That's so, I want to pause on that just for a second, just because I'm thinking like, is that a, like a nod to Christianity that like, cause I, I do find the differences between Chicago and Texas. There seems to be a lot more people who, or I guess a lot less people who struggle with the idea of a Christian God, just from what I've observed from mm -hmm. the people you guys work with. Do you think that has anything to do with it? I mean, the long and short is, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, probably. As a matter of fact, so we brought in a pro bono minister who would do the services and it was by and large a Christian service, mm -hmm. which isn't so offensive considering that it seems like the Jews and the Muslims largely handled that separately. Mm -hmm. um, we, we just never got any calls. And if, I mean, you know, there might have been some John Doe's. We did services. We, we got quite a few John and Jane Doe's. Hmm. that we would do a service for anyways. And that was a fun part of the job is I would often officiate that one, usually read some poetry or just kind of say some stuff. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it it was by and large a Christian service, but anybody who called, it was our policy that they could request otherwise, and it just never happened. That's so interesting. I'm going to have to look up and see what we do in Illinois. I literally have no idea, and I've never thought about it before. Yeah, no, and, I, and before I'd gone and uh planned these funerals uh i had worked as an event coordinator my job before i right. went back to school was planning weddings and mitzvahs so i thought it was kind of funny that like <laughs> yeah. my first job out of the gates would kind of be so much it, it's actually infinitely easier to plan a funeral than than a wedding yeah less less people uh, i guess given input yeah 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 i mean uh and especially on this level there were no personalized napkins or anything like that <laughs> right True. <laughs> <laughs> so back to not helping people. Go on. <laughs> oh, well, oh, well, so anyway, <laughs> my second job, oddly enough, was um, doing home visits with uh, seniors. Hmm. So I was working for Jewish Family Services. And if the some of the some of the people there, you know, they provide a lot of case management services there. And if the case manager determined that somebody was really depressed and would benefit from talking to somebody, they'd send me out there, an intern, to just kind of go talk to them. Hmm. And that was a really interesting experience because my first job as a, in any kind of clinical capacity, really, was going and meeting with seniors, most of whom had cognitive difficulties. Mm -hmm. One of them was like a Holocaust survivor. And, wow. I mean, here I was in my 20s, you know, showing up, you know, wanting to make a difference and <laughs> – you know, looking these people in the eyes and being like, hi, I'm your therapist. <laughs> <laughs> and the really, the really tricky business of it was, is that they by and large got worse every week. Yeah. You know, they were definitely in decline in every sense of the word. And so my first job was really showing up in a weekly fashion for people that every week got worse. Mm. So I really learned something very important there, which is that, well, hell, let me see if I can remember. Um, <laughs> it's so important I, this that it's a great just... spiel. This oh, is the, right. It's I love one of it. my best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm giving you my gold here. <laughs> if I can remember it. Well, so yeah, it, it's really that in some sense, there are things more important than somebody getting better. Yeah. And that showing up every week, you know, I mean, and this is super true uh, with, I think, suicidal patients or mm -hmm. um, say somebody who's schizophrenic or, you know, got a more chronic mental health condition. Mm -hmm. If the therapy is predicated on helping them in terms of them getting better, right. I think burnout is just inevitable or you just end up not helping people that got a losing hand in a certain kind of way. Mm hmm. And I've personally found it to be a deeply gratifying work to show up in a loving and supportive way, even though somebody's not going to get better. But how is that not healing still? Because it sounds like you're thinking about the word healing meaning to get better. And I think what makes something better is connection, even though the condition might not, quote unquote, get better. I still think of it as healing. 
Sure. Well, I mean, we're definitely out of the medical model at that point. Well, um, fuck that medical model. Yeah, which I don't really buy in too much anyways. I guess, yeah, I, I mean, at this point, we're probably in a fairly uh, sophisticated idea of what healing is. You know, and at this point, I guess I'd just sort of say that I, I think that the thing that draws me towards being a therapist more than anything is a love of the truth. Hmm. My favorite moments are just when I'm sitting with somebody and sort of like their authenticity just becomes more palpable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like uh, these moments where there's like a quickening of just there being more of their truth in the room. And, right. And I, it, I think it turns out that that is helpful. So it, it's not to say that I disregard the helpfulness, obviously, if I'm justifying to somebody who's thinking about coming to an IOP, <laughs> right. I, I leave that out of my pitch. Oh, good, good. I just uh, really think it's an honor to sit with people and be with their truth. And, and, and I see that as a sacred, creating a sacred space in which more and more of people's mm-hmm. truth can come into the room. And again, I, I think that turns out to be helpful. And I think that turns out to be healing. But those are like side mm-hmm. side effects. Right. Well, I guess I've never really thought of it that way. But I, I guess that really is what I love about therapy, too, is like helping people be more of themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah. And I, I remember my first job working with people in, in recovery at a detox. And I just was so inspired all the time, just seeing people doing their best to be the best version of themselves. And that's what I've realized I just want to surround myself with is people who are intending to work toward being the best version of themselves as much as possible. Yeah. As I was preparing for this, I started to think about, well, what my kind of the main stories I pull on to kind of make sense of healing. Mm hmm. Have you heard about the story of Philoctetes? I don't know. Tell me. Philoctetes is a he's a character in uh, Greek mythology. The only surviving text with him in it is one of Sophocles' plays, although I believe mm. Euripides and Aeschylus wrote one about him as well. The gist of it is, I think the pre-story is that when Heracles or Herodotus, some 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 Greek guy, uh, wanted to <laughs> to die by being burnt on a pyre alive so dramatic (laughs) philip Tides was the only one who would light the pyre for him Mm. and then once uh the guy died that way heracles awarded philip Tides this magic bow that had poison arrows that could uh you know sort of shoot and kill anybody so then it, it comes time for the Trojan War, Philoctetes was, you know, the Trojan War started, uh, you know, according to the mythology, when like three different guys, like we're all gonna um, court Helen. And there was like a contest. And then one of them won. Philoctetes is one of the guys that lost. And, and then when she was taken away, the other suitors had to go with, I think his name was Menelaus to go, you know, get her back. And then that's the Trojan War. It was probably just oil, but that's the story. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, it's usually oil. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyways, the story has it that Philoctetes, he got bit by a snake or something like that, I think, in the story. And then, like, he started screaming out and it festered. And I think the Greeks deserted him on this island because he was screaming out so much hmm. and his wounds smelled bad. I think that was the gist of it. All right. And so they deserted on there for like 10 years. And then they went off to fight the Trojan War. They weren't winning. And then finally they were like, hey, some god, I think maybe Hera or something, was like, hey, the you guys are cursed because you left Philoctetes and you got to go back and get him. Anyways, I'll cut it short. I mean, the gist <laughs> of it is, is that they have to go back and get this wounded guy to help him win. That's way too long of a story. You know, so it, it, the... the <laughs> I, the, the main point is, is it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, you know, he's deserted on this island for like 10 years and then they need him. So they come back to get him and he's like, fuck you, I ain't going to help. And, you know, they're basically trying to convince him that like his suffering amounted to something and that he can turn it all around and come help him. And he's like, yeah, right. I just want to go home and I don't want to help you guys. So it's a kind of story of like bitterness and suffering. Mm hmm. And I guess the other story that I think about a whole lot 
you know, so anyways, the whole point of that is just this, is this image I have in my mind of a guy that's been deserted in pain and then others are asking him for help and he's like, screw off, mm -hmm. I'm bitter and I'm still in pain. You know, finally, like the gods intervene and he helps them. But that's like a really unsatisfactory resolution of that problem. Yeah. And then I guess the other one that really comes to my mind is Job, where, you know, Job loses everything. And the really fascinating bit is that there's three people that come along and in the Bible they're called comforters, which is sort of hilarious because basically one after the other, their basic shtick is you must have done something wrong. Mm -hmm. That's good which... em empathy there. <laughs> Well, oddly enough, I, I actually think it is. Um, and I think it's what most of us do, even if we're more subtle about it. You know, but basically, I think it's easier when in a horrible situation to feel like it must have happened for some reason. Oh, of course. Yeah, to make sense out of it. Yeah, it's like the moral defense, which is basically... You know, like kids who grow up in horribly abusive environments, it's actually way easier for them to feel like it's because they did something wrong. Because at least in that narrative, there's a, a, a reason for it to happen. And then B, there's like uh, something they can do about it, which is try and be good. Mm -hmm. The alternative, though, is that it happened for no reason and that their caregivers are chaotic and Sick. unpredictable and possibly tantalizing. And what's really interesting is when God finally does show up, and it's it's usually considered to be not that satisfying of a resolution, but I think it really cuts to the core of how I understand healing, is basically God shows up and Job starts kind of making his case, and God basically says, you exist. You're welcome. You know? Yeah. <laughs> And the resolution is that Job, I, the, there's another ending, which is where he gets everything back. But historians think that that's just a kind of uh, add on later mm. because it's so unsatisfying. The actual resolution, which is that he's left, I think the the translation is some form of like shock and awe. But that that is actually he's calmed by just being confronted with existence itself. Mm hmm. And. I suppose that that's kind of the best I, I can do with suffering is I, I just really don't think that our job is to take it away. Right. And I also don't think that our job is always just to make meaning of it either. Mm. But I do think that if we can absorb it and be with it mm -hmm. and really be fully awake to the truth of it, mm -hmm. that there's a kind of awe and mystery that becomes possible just like that we're not really entitled to anything that mm. uh, even with suffering existence is sort of uh, some sort of miraculous thing that even if it's adverse, we're just simply not entitled to. That's so interesting. And it totally it brings up a ton of fear for me. Like as soon as you said, it's not even our job to make meaning out of it, because that's all my shit. That's like, no, 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 I have to make meaning because I have to feel safe. And that's why even though I wholly subscribe to to buddhist philosophy i struggle with the idea that that there is no god because i need somebody to be up there like making it okay and it's such a like groundlessness is such a terrifying concept for me that i've been trying to open to but it's hard totally i'll say uh my first actual real like kind of clinical job where i received <laughs> any bit of training <laughs> <laughs> really to speak of I didn't really feel like I got a whole lot of training in school and, mm -hmm. and I felt like I was kind of just thrown into these other really intense situations I worked with a at the Houston OCD program mm. and you know the treatment for that is exposure therapy and mm -hmm. I keep coming back to that really I think mm. I think exposure therapy the less behavioral kind of more less sciencey version of it I suppose is mm. I think exactly what you're saying I mean you're Mm -hmm. speaking to a kind of chasm that opens up when we stop kind of compulsively making meaning out of things. Right. That I think actually it takes about 20 years of concerted focusing on it to kind of settle down. Hmm. Like I think we just habituate to it. I think we acclimate 
And then by the time we're 70, sort of like we can just kind of hang out with the deep intimacy of nothingness. Because otherwise, I suppose death would be very terrifying. Yeah, I got all my chips in that table or eggs in that basket. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I and <laughs> it's that funny. It breaks down. I'm screwed. <laughs> well, and, and the way that I've thought about death, you know, like both my parents died in 2014. And so I've, I've, you know, been confronted with it in a really interesting way. And the way that I've conceptualized it, I've made I've made a conceptualization about it, which makes me then feel safe, which makes me feel like, okay, if I die, I'll be fine. <laughs> but it's only sure. because I made meaning out of it. Yeah, which is, I think, uh, a great, like, transitional thing to do. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, well, let's put it this way. Not making meaning, you still end up making meaning. You know, it, it's just, I, I think, in a way, I'd say that no matter what, we kind of end up making a meaning of it. And really, I think what you're calling making meaning is, is sort of just having a way of processing it such mm -hmm. that it can be metabolized and right. digested and kind of absorbed. And I think there would be no version of it without that transitionally. And I, I, I think it's a, a way, like it, it wouldn't be like appropriate with patients to sort of not make meaning of their travail. Because mm -hmm. um, they're already doing that. It's just usually these automatic negative thoughts mm -hmm. and kind of self-defeating beliefs that kind of create these really painful, vicious cycles in their lives and characterized by avoidance and mm -hmm. self-hatred, typically. Mm -hmm. So I think so much of what we do is supporting people and making a kind of meaning of these experiences that has like a greater degree of uh, grace for a lack of be better of a word there. Yeah. And to kind of pivot into, you know, some of the, the wounded healer talk, I guess, you know, when I think about creating space and, and being able to help people make meaning and or sit with some of the stuff that they're struggling with, I know I certainly tap into my own wounds and the struggles that I've had. So I guess I'm curious how you relate to that concept of even if you're not going to call yourself a healer or even believe that you do healing, but, um, <laughs> Definitely wounded. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That one's easier to swallow. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, well, I'll say this. I, I personally would never feel any degree of trust for a therapist unless I thought that he or she had been a completely miserable bastard or gal. You know, I only trust somebody who seems like they kind of been to hell and back and it kind of has that earned innocence of sort of recovering from suffering. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I just sort of don't feel like uh, the person has a capacity to understand things. At this point, I, I just like actually don't think suffering's a bad thing. That's kind of that Job business again. Mm -hmm. I think that's just kind of a bitching in the ultimate sense. I mean, we hold space for a lot of bitching, and that's a very good thing. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't mean that pejoratively. Right. But rather, you know, the most I can kind of muster in terms of feeling righteous about how suffering shouldn't be happening is, it isn't that it's a bad thing, but just that it, it sucks, you know? It's like while it's happening, it's just like the kind of, the most I can kind of muster in terms of like not valuing it would just be that I don't like it. Right. <laughs> You know? Yes. I think every major growth spurt that I've ever been through was in the, was kind of forced upon me, so to speak. Oh, absolutely. I think that it's the uh, grit, the sand and an oyster that makes a pearl. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious because, so I definitely struggle in the self-worth department and, you know, everything that you're saying around this, I completely... I know that I understand it cognitively and believe it. And it's such a struggle for me to truly really embrace that part of myself. You know, yeah. it's so much easier for me to look at somebody else and be like, oh yeah, your suffering made you a kick-ass person and blah, blah, you know? So I guess I'm just curious your thoughts on, on that. Like from someone who was, you know, crying in their room as a, a teenage boy where are you now with self-acceptance, self-worth? Yeah, I mean, well, there was a paradox, I guess, in all of that, which is that I felt 
like inferior on the one hand, but also like horribly misunderstood on the other. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, I had this sort of secret suspicion that I really was special. Mm -hmm. And that other people were missing that and I wasn't Mm -hmm. made for this world kind of thing. And yeah. And I think as I've worked through a lot of the like kind of inferiority, I'm more left with the other thing. Mm. I would say that these days, you know, and some of this is just like straight up male privilege. I mean, you know, I tend to think that everybody wants to hear what I have to say. Hmm. And so if I'm in a room, I just like I enjoy hearing myself speak and I assume other people do, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and. I, you know, I did have an experience about seven years ago where I really started to kind of turn the corner with feeling like a really good looking person, too. Hmm. You know, I, I was in graduate school and I was just a wreck in graduate school. I did just terrible job networking there. But, you know, I turned 30 and uh, I'd been in this like long term relationship and you know, she wanted to have kids and I wanted to go back to graduate school. And, you know, we, we ended up splitting up over it, kind of some money stuff, I suppose. That's always more complicated than that. I'm over mm-hmm. something it. But all of a sudden, basically, I was a single freshman waiting tables again and, and turned 30. And I just freaked out and hmm. started really pretending like I was still in my mid-20s in terms of partying hard and stuff. And hmm. I started dating this girl who I thought was really beautiful she was younger and I was like living with her in her like really crappy apartment with like a bunch of people. And, but I had this really interesting experience where I had that I was meditating and I had this fantasy of people seeing me with this beautiful person and, um, looking at me and feeling, you know, when I felt into it, it wasn't like I wanted people to be proud of me Mm -hmm. uh, or happy for me. I, I wanted people to feel envy and really like just look at me with a beautiful person and 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 I really got how like as a male historically I've known my beauty through like kind of vicariously glomming onto the beauty of women and Hmm. and then how that sort of created this real collusion in me with the standard images of beauty that I I think are quite disgusting in a lot of ways and just Mm -hmm. the kind of how much they ravage humans yeah nonetheless I was I was working through it and I had this interesting experience of all of a sudden feeling like this like body posture that was crumpled up and I felt hot and sweaty and really repulsive and there was kind of like uh internalization of anti-semitism in that as well where I felt Hmm. like this repulsive Jew clinging to a beautiful person and Hmm. I felt like a little golem like Hmm. clinging to my precious, you know? Wow. And it it was the most palpable experience I've ever felt of just directly feeling kind of my own disconnection from how beautiful I am and Hmm. how sexy I am. And, and it was a real turning point for me to just kind of hang out with that. And then just kind of, I don't know, kind of like the habituating. I mean, just going into the core of something over and over again and Mm -hmm. just feeling how repulsed I am by myself really freed up a whole lot it's like in not avoiding that experience it became less of a wound around us feeling yeah. how much i love my you know shitty body <laughs> <laughs> just, i really like it i mean I, i've fallen in love with my hair patterns and my hair i got a hairy chest and i used to wish my jaw was a little bigger and my and i just i, I like it now and mm. you know if anybody disagrees you know fuck them hard you know, it's not even in a reactive way. It's just like, it's cool. You work your side of the road. I'll work mine, you know? Right. Um, I just don't feel like I need others to know myself as beautiful. I just, I think it's such a fucking miracle that we get to have these bodies for a little mm-hmm. while. Right. And they fall apart. And, right. You know, and that they house like these psyches that like work through some shit. I, I just think it's, mm-hmm. you know body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. I mean, for serious. Yeah. And it's, it's just so interesting the way you describe kind of going into the wound. Cause that's, that's something in, in one of my last interviews with this woman, Sarah Beek, she wrote a book called Revelations and it's pretty intense. And she talks about the experience of 
going inside the wound. And I guess I'm also always thinking of anybody else who might be listening who could be like, what the fuck? That's impossible. I'm not doing that. And so I guess I just want to share with people that there needs to be some sort of like base level of okayness to then be able to go inside the wound, right? Because if you have recently experienced trauma or have unresolved trauma or things like that, going inside the wound, not recommended, especially not alone. But I kind of feel like that's, it's like next level healing kind of shit. Yeah. I think of all therapeutic work is basically exposure. Mm -hmm. We're going there. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible to just not be that bothered by rejection. You know, I mean, a lot. it's where I think a lot of the kind of self-esteem therapies go awry mm -hmm. is the, the affirmations fall really flat, you know? And self-esteem is about comparison. And you were just talking about being able to remove that level of comparison and just recognizing your shitty body for what it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and like the reframes that are like a lot of like CBT stuff can be mm -hmm. so cheap. You know, the, the ones that they go for. It's like, you don't know that people are judging you. That's mind reading or something. Like, no, everyone is judging. Yeah. Because like, that's it, what we within do. Within the first two seconds of seeing everybody, we've already implicitly Tinder swiped them. I mean, we know. Right. You know, CBT like, is dumb. I've said it a million I, times. Actually, I, I completely disagree. I can't get uh, on board with the idea of changing like changing the way i think doesn't change the way i feel it's the i i need to change the way i relate to the thought that changes the way i feel that's my thought yeah. on cbt I, I just don't see a difference in the two things you said I, what i do completely agree is that there's nothing worse than really like lamely stupidly done cbt it's like the worst <laughs> and maybe that's all i've ever seen when it's done with it, with like sophistication and beauty, I, I think it's just an immaculate therapy. Well, then I would need to see that sometime. Just take my word for it. Okay. <laughs> I will. Done. Done. Yeah. I believe you. So we're coming up on the end of that. So now. Almost. Yeah. Do you believe it? You're just busy I listening think... to yourself talk. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoying so it, right? It's fun when I hear myself speak. <laughs> I know. I do too. So. I was just going to say, is there anything else that you'd like to hear yourself say before we end today? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Good. Mic drop. <laughs> Said it all. <laughs> Hope you liked it. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I loved it. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see what listeners think, but I loved it. I think you're fascinating. Well, thank you. Like I said before, I think you're one of the biggest freaks I've ever met, and I love that about you. Well, you know, I, I will say this. I feel like people don't take as kindly to bragging as they should. Mm -hmm, like I, I think mm -hmm. bragging is I mean, why wouldn't people brag and just like say what's amazing about themselves? I mean, mm. we're so stingy about that. I know. And it's just absurd. I mean, socialization. Know, so I, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm awesome and I think you're awesome. And that's just like I, I mean this. I'm not just saying it rhetorically. Yeah. I, I actually don't understand why we're so sheepish about that. Yeah. I mean, for me, I know it was certainly humility was required because that was what God said to do. And then this idea that being humble is essentially never talking about your positive attributes or just always being grateful for them. And that's, I wonder if that too is a gender thing as well. I mean, more so for women than for men. Cause I just, I talk about it with other female practice owners all the time, just about how together when we're, in a room together, we'll let each other brag and, and say whatever the fuck we want, but we wouldn't necessarily say that out in the world. Yeah. Because what would it look like? <gasps> Gasp. Well, I think you're awesome, and I think you should just be way too big for your britches. Wow. That makes me scared. That could be a whole nother podcast on how much that scares me. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Well, on that note, this has been fun. Yeah. No, I really enjoyed it. I can't believe that was an hour. That's crazy. I know. It feels, seriously, it feels like 20 minutes. I know, right? Um, well, we'll just have to have you on again another time. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. All right, Sarah. You be well. You too. 
Thanks so much to Michael Lassoff for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And as always, thanks to Andrea Clunder and Edwin Ruiz at the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art photo, and Ben Mueller for our theme music. For more information on Michael Lassoff, you can visit my website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. You can also find Conversations with the Wounded Healer on Facebook and Twitter, and don't forget to follow us on Spotify or subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Thanks so much for tuning in. Bye-bye.